welcome back. This is chapter 4, video 3, where we're continuing our discussion of the derivation rules. In this video, we'll cover hook introduction and hook elimination. Let's take a look at these two rules. On top, on the right-hand side, we have hook introduction. What this rule form is telling us is that if we start a subderivation with an auxiliary assumption of P, then, with perhaps some work, we can derive Q in its direct syntactic negation, not Q, then the fact that P led to a contradiction allows us to move out of the subderivation and attach a hook to the original auxiliary assumption. You see that hook elimination below is of essentially the same structure, except here we start with a hook in our auxiliary assumption, we derive the contradiction, and that allows us to remove the hook so we wind up with just P. Now we'll see an example of this in a minute. But it may look a little bit strange. How should arriving at a contradiction allow me to prove the opposite of what I assumed? Well, this is a formal version of an argumentative style called reductio ad absurdum. Which means to reduce to absurdity. The basic strategy here is you take something that you believe to be false some claim, say, P, and you show that it leads to something absurd. Either a direct contradiction, as in our formal version on the right-hand side, or some obviously false or absurd consequence. If P leads to a contradiction, or an obvious falsehood, or absurdity, then P can't be true, so not P must be true. In the formal version of this, we require a direct syntactic contradiction. Some formula, however simple or complex, and then the direct negation of that formula. So again, focusing on just the hook introduction, the basic idea is we make an auxiliary assumption, demonstrate that it leads to a contradiction, and then that allows us to move out from the subderivation and attach a hook. If P leads to a contradiction, then we must arrive at not P. Here's a simple argument which will allow us to illustrate the pattern. We've got three premises. If Bob goes to the fair, then Carol won't. If Ann goes to the fair, then Bob will. Carol will go to the fair only if Ann does. We can conclude, though it might not be initially obvious, that Carol does not go to the fair. We can prove this with what essentially is a hook introduction or a reductio ad absurdum argument. How will we prove that Carol does not go to the fair? Well, first, let's suppose that she does and see what will happen. So we suppose Carol does go to the fair. Now, if Carol does go to the fair, it turns out based on 3 and our new assumption in 4 that Anne goes to the fair. But that means, together with 2, that Bob goes to the fair. But 1 told us that if Bob goes to the fair, then Carol won't. And since 6 says that Bob goes to the fair, that tells us that Carol won't go to the fair. But that contradicts our assumption in line 4. Recall that our assumption in line 4 told us that Carol does go to the fair. So now, on the assumption in line 4 that Carol goes, we've got her both going to the fair and not going to the fair. That's a contradiction. Since that can't happen, and it all came out of the original premises,
plus the assumption that Carol does go to the fair, it's not possible for her to go to the fair. Thus, Carol doesn't go to the fair. This may seem a little bit confusing at first, but it's actually a fairly standard style of argumentation in logic and mathematics. Now, how would this argument look if we formalize it? Well, we need three primary assumptions for the three premises. If Bob goes to the fair, then it's not the case that Carol goes to the fair. If Anne goes to the fair, then Bob will go to the fair. And Carol will go to the fair only if Anne does. The goal statement here, of course, is it's not the case that Carol goes to the fair, or not C. If we move an exact parallel to the English argument, we'll suppose, and when we're doing a derivation, that amounts to making an auxiliary assumption to start a subderivation. Suppose that Carol goes to the fair. Well, obviously, 3 and 4 and an arrow elimination will give us and goes to the fair. And line 5, together with 2 and an arrow elimination, will give us that Bob goes to the fair. Now that, line 6, together with line 1, and again another arrow elimination, gives us that Carol does not go to the fair. Now, we've arrived at the goal sentence, but keep in mind, we're still inside of a subderivation. We need to get not C out on the main scope line for it to count as having been derived from just the primary assumptions. Now, are we in a position to do that? Let's take a look at what's going on with our subderivation and compare it to the rule form. We started out with an auxiliary assumption, just as we did here. So our assumption of C is actually the meta P in the rule form. We did some work, and we got down to a negated statement. That is the not Q in the rule form. The only problem is, is that we're missing a straight up Q to demonstrate the contradiction underneath the assumption. So what do we need to do? Now it's actually very simple. We need to give ourselves a little bit more room in the derivation. So we'll move this down, extend both scope lines. we would like to have a C right here. And in fact, we can do that using the reiteration rule. As you saw earlier, a use of the reiteration rule is to properly position formulas in subderivations. So we can justify line 8 as coming from 4 by reiteration. Now here's another interesting thing. We are now in a position to apply the hook introduction rule. We made an auxiliary assumption, just as we were supposed to, and we wound up with a direct contradiction. Some statement, Q, and the direct negation of that statement, not Q. Now, in our derivation, the not Q comes before the Q, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that they both be underneath the auxiliary assumption on the same scope line as the auxiliary assumption. The other interesting thing here is that in this derivation, it turns out that P is the same formula as Q, and that can happen sometimes. It can be a little bit confusing in a hook introduction or hook elimination, but it's perfectly legitimate.
So again, just to point out exactly what we're looking at here. We made an assumption, we did some work, and it led to a contradiction. Given that situation, we are allowed to move out of the subderivation, take the bit that we assumed, and add a hook to it. So our justification for the final line here is going to be 4 through 8 hook introduction. And if you glance over on the left at the English version, you can see we've exactly paralleled it here in the derivation. Let's look at another example involving hook introduction. This one is a little bit more complicated, but it's not terribly complicated. We've got two primary assumptions, and we're trying to derive hook E and B. We'll put our goal in down at the bottom of the derivation. And since the main connective of this goal statement is a hook, it's very likely that we're going to use hook introduction to derive it. That means we're going to need a subderivation. And the auxiliary assumption of that subderivation should be exactly what we want, just with the hook removed. So if we want hook parenthesis E and B, then we should assume E and B. Now remember, the auxiliary assumption can only be a single line, one formula, but that formula can be as complex as we need it to be. Now in order to complete this subderivation, we're going to need to derive some sentence and the direct negation of that sentence. They don't necessarily have to be in that exact order. They can go not Q, then Q, if we want them to. Now it might not be obvious right at the start what that contradiction is going to be, but we can get things moving in the derivation and see what turns up. So what we might do here is uh, separate E from line 3 by AND elimination. And we can get the B out also 3 AND elimination. Then perhaps we get the C from line 1 by AND elimination, and get the E arrow D out of line 1 by AND elimination. Next, perhaps, we can use lines 4 and 7 to get D from arrow elimination. If we combine lines 4 and 6, we get E and C. That is an AND introduction or conjunction introduction. That looks to me like maybe we need a little more space here, so let's make it for ourselves. Now, with the conjunction I have in line 9, since it matches the antecedent of line 2, I can use an arrow elimination to derive the consequent of line 2, which is not parenthesis D and B. by arrow elimination. Now it turns out that in line 5 I have a B and in line 8 I have a D, so I could put those together into a conjunction D and B. So again that's 5 and 8 conjunction or AND introduction. Now if you look carefully you see that we do in fact have a contradiction between line 10 and 11. 10 is the exact same thing as we have in 11, only with the whole thing negated. So that means that our assumption in line 3 leads to a contradiction. So we can exit the subderivation and add a hook to our assumption. And our justification will be 3 through 11, hook introduction. Let's look at one more derivation so that we have an example of hook elimination.
This is a fairly simple one, but sometimes it can be confusing. If you're just asked to derive, say, D, a single atomic formula, it might not be clear how to go about it. I don't see any Ds in the primary assumptions except in number one, and it's got a negation on it. Well, one thing you can do as a last resort, or if you see that letter up there with a hook on it, is you can try to assume the negation of your goal and do a hook elimination. The pattern here is basically the same. We're shooting for a contradiction, only this time it'll allow us to remove the hook from the auxiliary assumption as opposed to adding a hook to the auxiliary assumption. Now, looking at the primary assumptions, it looks like a good candidate for Q and not Q are F and not F right there. If I can get those, then I've got my contradiction and I'll be allowed to remove the hook from my auxiliary assumption, which will get me D. As a matter of fact, why don't we just go right ahead and get that not F out of line 2 since it's just a nice simple conjunction elimination. Now, to get at the other F, we need to get the consequent out of line 1. Luckily, the antecedent of line 1 was our auxiliary assumption in line 3. So 1 and 3, arrow elimination, is going to get us not C and F. And we can pull the F right out of there with a wedge elimination, conjunction elimination. Now, my Q and not Q are not right next to each other, but I very clearly have a contradiction in lines 4 and 6. So I can exit the subderivation, move out to the main scope line, and my justification for removing the hook from not D in line 3 is 3 through 6 hook elimination. next video on derivations will continue with the V or disjunction rules. We'll talk about V introduction and V elimination.